Interesting. Because we can compartmentalize our consciousness. We can stop feeling anger. Trust me. <laughs> Lots of practice. <laughs> You're an expert on this. Yeah. Our culture is an expert on this. And what happens when that happens? Well, it comes out somewhere else, not consciously. It comes out in war, you know, minor things. Death. Honking. Honking. Yeah. Shooting people. You know, all these kinds of things. We can keep suppressing symptoms, you know. Oh, now I'm depressed. I suppressed my anger. Now I'm depressed. Yeah, I'm angry at myself for shutting down my energy. For shutting my down. What, what is anger? It's energy to correct wrongs. And Pray to God that by the time you have the anger, you also have the wisdom, which is also seated in the same place, to apply that energy that we could term anger into a productive recycling of whatever needs to be changed. Put it into a better form. It's like, I'm going to take the garbage out. I'm pissed off that the flies are in the kitchen. And instead of spraying more poison on it, trying to you know, kill the maggots, I'm going to take the garbage out. But it might take that, I'm angry at the flies. Oh, because we associate now the word, the emotion, the identification of that state, interior state of the dark energy with the sensorium, with what's happening around me, with the person next to me. Did you ever have somebody angry at you and, wait a minute, what did I do? But you're there. You're the attachment. You're the human connection. We are communicating beings. We are communal beings. We are. I have a question. Um, are we outside of causality and time when we leave the body? Do you think? <laughs> I know you don't know. <laughs> what, what do you think? think? <laughs> I can tell you, in terms of data, I have my own experience to, to, to look at first because it's, I can vouch for that. <laughs> I don't have to you know, trust anybody else's report. Right? Oh, you experienced that? Okay. Uh, trust you or not trust you? We have a tendency to not trust that experience which does not agree with our model of how we've now linguistically identified the possibilities. It's like, well, that's not in the realm of possibilities, so we can't publish that research in this journal. I'm sorry. We can't even keep your professorship. <laughs> There's certainly no research money for that. Well, if you leave the body, so looking at my own experience, I have to say the times when I've been, all evidence points to me having been out of my body. My body, by other people's report afterwards, was on the ground shaking. I was having a seizure by, from a, a, a medical point of view. I, to me, I was never having a seizure. I, you know, I, by the time I came to in my body, my body wasn't seizing. Uh, I had a completely lucid out-of-body experience in the same locale, but in a different space-time, you know, if we talk about space-time as a four space, different space-time experience, but in the same lo location in a sense. Not with the same people there necessarily, not with the same dead tree there. There, there, there were differences, but yet it was the same place, the same shoreline, the same lo locus on the earth, or the same, in one case it was a train, so the same locus in this train car. I was, in, I was in the train car, still, but, and there were other people around, maybe, kind of, but they weren't, uh, I mean, I presume, I don't know, all I remember seeing, I couldn't even see my own hands when I was asked to, well, to bring my hands up beneath the angel's hands, which was, was a, a man, a tall man, as far as I knew at the time, human, I'm having an experience with this man. And, and, and I couldn't bring my hands up. And he says, that's okay, just, you know, just imagine that you are and, and you know, do this and feel. And he was testing me and saying how, you know, under, maybe under different circumstances, he could do good work with me, you know, whatever, but I'm not sure if he'll if he'd connect with me again, but, but that we, we could have done good work. But I was about to leave Japan where this happened. And this is a seven foot tall black man on the, on the Japanese subway and my Japanese friends didn't see anyone, you know, when I came to, I'm, they're like helping me onto the, the seat and I'm like, okay, but want to talk about <laughs> what I just was told, and, you know, the experience I just had. Uh, not like whatever about my body being, uh, I have no clue what you're talking about, I want it, but this is important, <laughs> listen to me, <laughs> right? 
there's a level of importance when they have a true vision, whether it's, you know, we're, in, we're sleeping and then we have a dream that's not a dream, that's visionary, that we know is true and it's more real than waking life and we know it's the sense that it's future. We can identify. Future is different than past. We, like we can identify self or another beloved, someone we know, whether we've met them before or not in t this timeline, not consequential. When I met Ray, I knew that I knew her. I knew I didn't know her from the past. Therefore, my conclusion was that I knew her from the future, an experience that I had had already some times to, that I'd identified for myself but never verbalized. She's the first person I vocalized that to. It's like, I pre-member you. I made up a new word for it and said, I pre-member you. So, who we are is who we're becoming. That's our future self, what I call it, one word for it. Our future self is our true self. Our higher self, yes, okay. In the hierarchy of time, as we grow from one cell to billions and trillions and you know, expand our consciousness. Our consciousness isn't limited by the head, by the way. It may be a relevant, a relevant, not irrelevant, a relevant sphere. It's not the only sphere. Just like an electron, there's a relevant sphere there where the where a photon is going in a, a double loop in a Mobius strip folded on itself, so it creates this electrical field. It's this light going around in a circle. This is the model of the electron in, in a model of everything, theory of everything. Uh, and it's borrowed from another person who proposes that model, and it totally explains the electrical fields and etc. So it's consistent with, you know, with the best measurements that we have of, of the way things are, really are. Uh, that electron, well, it's, it exists in a variety of states. And that's one of them. That's a quantized, you know, our model of an electron is a photon going in, a, in that Mobius strip little lo loop is when we actually call it an electron. It's a quantum. It has a certain amount of energy relative to things around it. It's maybe part of an atom, or it's ionized and it's part of a plasma. Maybe it's part of a plasma that has a condensate in it, as I model the, the, the water on the cell membrane, where our consciousness of the membrane itself can have this spaciousness, this expansiveness of, of vision of three-dimensionality of multidimensionality in time, of understanding that the, the future and the past are present, are connected to the now. And now is not separate, this dead thing moving forward that we can define by the movement of the particles within it. So how do we take this kind of big information that you're saying right now and relate it to your earlier example of the headache being caused by the colon? If I take an aspirin, it doesn't make the colon less toxic. It actually adds toxins. It's a toxin that deposits in the tissues where the headache was and will be associated with chronic headaches in the future. It goes to the liver and has to be broken down and creates adds more to the detoxification work of the liver. Um, and it blocks, its, its essential function is to block function. It stops part of the body from working. It makes us less intact, less coherent, less fully aware, conscious, and alive. Yeah. Is, it, or is it like a, an anesthet anesthetic in a way then, an as anesthesia, an aspirin, like by blocking consciousness of the pain? It, it's akin to it. They're both, they're both stopping a function. Okay. Yeah. yeah. They're masking it and creating yeah. more damage. In yeah, with, a, with an anesthetic, you're directly blocking the nerve cell that's feeling it. With, with an aspirin, you're primarily blocking immune function, inflammatory pathways that are essential to detoxifying the tissues, which means it's essential to preventing cancer and maintaining health with integrity through time. So when you're saying if someone is passing while leaving their body while they're on morphine, what, what were you meaning by that? Well, the spiritual view has always been that, that it's a grace to be conscious, to know, number to one, know to know that we're going to pass, mm -hmm. so we can prepare. Yeah. If you're going to prepare for a journey to Europe, do you want to know ahead of time, or do you want to just go? As is, no, no preparation. 
well, no, ahead of time, would you know, organize myself, prepare my, my th so, thoughts, so it's almost my maps. like a sabotage to go in a way that you're not even getting to experience the red. Yeah, we don't even know. Yeah, we don't even know. What are we doing? Why is it that with general anesthesia, a good portion of people don't come fully back? Maybe it's like 20% with general anesthesia, a significant amount, but you know, there's probably some disruption of the spirit, the consciousness embodied in the physical body by that kind of toxin. That's what it does. Mm -hmm. So all good things in moderation and something that's not good for us. You know, we're trying to do a good indirectly. We're doing this harm, but there's the benefit outweighs the risk, but we're doing harm. There's ultimately a way, path of healing that's, that is perfect, that does not require that. It's just that our knowledge is limited. We're trying to gain more knowledge, but then we have to transcend knowledge through actually experience, which when our models become highly theoretic, like a black hole, we have wonderful mathematics for it, but none of us has ever seen one. We can imagine it because we can see things that we can say, well, there's, it's causing that. And we didn't think it would cause that. We didn't think it would cause anything we could see because we thought it would just suck everything in. So it's not what we thought. It can't be what we thought. Well, it can't be that. We have to modify it to, to fit what we see. But what if what we see is still something different? When, when you have a condensate that's in a coherent state, it acts as a single quantum, even though it could be as large as your head. It could be that sphere of consciousness of the brain level. And it'll act as out of a single point, single center point. And, and its relationship to gravity is it can also levitate. It, it's not limited by, it because the type of matter in it, even when it has the, uh, the structured water as uh, the, the hydroxyl uh, sheet structures of, of, of uh, hexagonal water, or hydrogen, oxygen, uh, that's a negatively charged sheet, those in a coherent state, those negative charges are no, no longer electrons. Electron is a thing. We know that it's not, that it really, when you look inside the electron, it's not thing-like at all. Inside it's just it's space. It's this photon that's moving around on a path, so it has this thingness because it has location. You know, it's like real estate. Location, location, location. What's matter about? Well, pr the proton, it has a sp its spot, and it takes some energy to move it. It doesn't take a whole lot of energy to move the electron, so it has less mass. It's a little gyroscope, but it's a littler gyroscope. Here's a big gyroscope. It's an atom of gold, or palladium, or rhodium, or iridium. It's this big thing, and yet, in the, in the high spin state of the nucleus, it has only five-ninths the mass that it would have in the normal metallic state of matter. And that's the type that makes up the soul. So it's already Lightweight in mass, it, it's, it's, it's about half not here. It's four ninths, non-local. Non-local is like between the photon and the star and the photon that I saw. It was potentially anywhere. <laughs> and if it wasn't anywhere, it wasn't missing any time doing it. It was there and it's here. So, okay, how did it get here? Well, I called it. I saw it into being. Where did the energy of that photon come from? Right? How big, if that star is across the universe, and I can still see there to be a galaxy, let's say, I see it. That light came all the way across the universe. Imagine the size of the sphere that that electromagnetic wave is, and that the energy from some area of that wave, some huge area of that wave, is instantaneously here now in the seeing of it. So we have to, we have to understand non-locality, which we can't. Can't see. Can, show me something that's non-local. Can't see it. It's dark. <laughs> dark matter, dark energy. Okay. Can't see it. It's not interacting with the photons in that way. It's not inter interacting with one model of gravity is very low wavelength photons. So low that, you know, like what, what about a photon with a wavelength the size of the primary, the primary resonance of the entire universe as a sphere? If 
to model it that way. Uh, well, we can't measure that. Nothing close to it. So if all these low wavelengths are gravity because stuff that has a, a place, the, the, the nucleus, the, 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 the protons and the neutrons and the nucleus of atoms, that's the dense stuff, right? That's matter. Electrons have a little bit of mass. Okay, so what? They're mostly electric charge. So, so here's our poster boy of matter is an atomic nucleus. Take, let's take palladium. Why? Because palladium, well, it's the deepest acting homeopathically. So the energy of it is the deepest acting in our spirit, in our, our energy field, in homeopathy. Wow. And that's an important thing in homeopathy. That's, this is like, you know, the core or center of homeopathy is where you're healing, healing the spirit first before the body because it's coming out of the more important places, going through the less important on the way out to, like, not so important at all. Self, not self. Healing from the core to the periphery. So if I'm sleeping better and more, my mind is clearer and I have more energy and, and my, my poop stinks and, and, and I'm sweating and, and it smells and, and I'm urinating more and has a funny color and my skin is showing like a rash, it's coming out. Do I want to suppress that with a cordless steroid cream? Do I want to take some drug that, that makes, you know, that, that's, that solidifies my stool, you know? So I don't poop out the the you know the radioactive particles that are trying my body's trying to get rid of and then reabsorb them. Now I gotta reintoxicate myself. No, we want to understand symptoms as effect, and that the cause is usually at the other end of the body. It's usually somewhere else. The body's if it's working as a whole, here's the cause, here's the effect. You can palliate, you can soften the the effect with things that do no harm, things that are not synthetic, that are not created in the last, you know, one generation, two generations of DNA, and, right, that our body's not designed for, however much we designed it for the body, sorry, <laughs> the body's not designed for it, doesn't qualify. All the medicine is already here. It's in nature. It's in the 97% of varieties of food that we no longer have, that we had 100 years ago. You know, is it too late? No, there's always more than sufficient grace. Nature, life, is creative. We we'll create more goodness. But we have to stay centered in, in the heart, in the dark energy, bring it into the light of the spirit. <laughs>